Good evening, everyone. My name is Maya Locker, and I'm the Programs and Events Coordinator here at the Museum at Eldridge Street. Thank you so much for joining us for this Museum at Eldridge Street seminar in collaboration with the Seward Park Library. Um, I have turned on live captioning for accessibility, which is powered by AI, so please forgive any mistakes that you may see. We will be having a Q&A at the end where I will enable you to unmute yourselves and ask our presenters any questions that you may have. In the meantime, feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Scott. Before we begin, I'd like to mention some exciting upcoming events that we have going on at the Museum at Eldridge Street. Um, for those of you who are new to us and to our programming, the Museum at Eldridge Street is housed in the historic Eldridge Street Synagogue. Built in 1887, it was the first grand synagogue built by Eastern European Jews in the US. The grand building was nearly lost to neglect in the mid 20th century before the museum's massive restoration project returned the space to its former glory and for public use. If you can go to the next slide, Scott, I'd like to highlight our upcoming programming for a moment. We offer both in-person and virtual programming, and you can find all of it listed on our website at eldridgestreet.org events. Some of our upcoming in-person programming includes um, an exhibition tomorrow, Thursday at 6 p.m. in the museum's gallery space. We are thrilled to welcome a new exhibition to Eldridge Street from acclaimed artist Mark Podwell, a collage of customs, iconic Jewish woodcuts revised for the 20th century. This exhibition opening is a wonderful opportunity to hear from the artist about his work and view the museum after hours. We are also offering a special walking tour of the Lower East Side in honor of Mother's Day on Sunday, May 14th at 11 a.m., which we call our Mamas with Chutzpah walking tour. Discover and honor the women who both witnessed, shaped social, artistic, financial, political change on the Lower East Side from the late 19th to the early 20th century. If you can go to the next slide, Scott, our next Zoom program is a part of our ongoing Cinema Chat series where we invite an expert to discuss a specific film with us. Next week on Wednesday, May 17th at 6 p.m., join us for a discussion about the acclaimed Spielberg film, The Fablemans, um, which was released in 2022. Join moderator Lucy Shahar and Chicago, film, um, Chicago Tribune film critic Michael Phillips to hear Michael's thoughts on the film and to share your own. You can read about and register for all of our programming on our website, eldridgestreet.org slash events. If you can go to the next slide, Scott, whether it's for a program or not, we would love to welcome you to the museum at Eldridge Street. We are located at 12 Eldridge Street in Manhattan's Chinatown, and we're open every day except Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers this evening from both the museum at Eldridge Street and Seward Park Library, Scott Brevda and Andrew Fairweather. Scott Brevda is a senior educator and the visitor services operations manager at the museum at Eldridge Street. As a historian, museum educator, and lifelong New Yorker, Scott loves to bring the history of his native city to life. In his current position, Scott manages the museum's day-to-day -day operations and leads, coordinates, and develops education programs at the museum. Scott was formerly a senior educator at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, and he holds a BA and MA in history from Fordham University. Um, for the past 10 years, Andrew Fairweather has been a librarian at the Seward Park Library, at the, at the Seward Park branch of the New York Public Library, excuse me, on New York's Lower East Side. Um, in his time at the library, he's provided an array of programming ranging from local history tours, genealogy workshops, and lectures on great works of literature and philosophy. He enjoys reading, painting, and other, as he says, quiet sports. And with that, I will turn the screen over to Scott to start us off. Thank you so much for being here with us, Scott and Andrew, for this um, special collaboration. us and uh, thanks for having us uh, Maya and thanks to everyone uh, joining us here tonight. Uh, our topic uh, open spaces on the Lower East Side uh, is one that has been part of the neighborhood's history for, for quite a while and particularly came uh, to at least one peak at the turn of the 20th century but in many ways uh, still uh, is an issue throughout the area and really throughout New York City today. For the period we'll be looking at primarily uh, this was a period of the neighborhood from about 1880 to 1924, when the Lower East Side became the most densely populated area, not just in New York City, but in the whole country, and by some estimates, even the whole world. Over about 40 years, about one third of Europe's Jewish population would pour into the neighborhood from Central Europe, uh, nations like Poland, Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Moldova, and a host of other nations, some of which have been in the news lately, unfortunately. Uh, the and these immigrants uh, coming across the Atlantic in great numbers were fleeing uh, oppressive laws passed by the czar, pogroms, which would from time to time uh, attack, uh, cause attacks to uh, go into their, uh, their neighborhoods and villages. 
uh, and in addition, seeking a new and better life here in New York City. Uh, over 40 years, as I said, about one third of uh, Europe's Jews would cross the Atlantic. It's about two and a half million people in total, roughly the entire population of Brooklyn crossing the Atlantic in 40 years. While there would be a number of ports they would go to up and down the eastern seaboard, it was primarily a New York City vis-a-vis -vis Castle Garden and eventually Ellis Island, through which these new immigrants would come to build a better life. Uh, we can see here the image of the SS Patrice or Patricia arriving in New York City and New York Harbor uh, specifically in 1906. Uh, it, that's not hyperbole to say that on deck the, sh uh, the, the ship was standing was a st standing room only. Uh, as the ship was pulling into the harbor, many immigrants would, would flock to the deck to see the green statue standing in the bay, welcoming them to this new life in this new land. Uh, what they were coming to, the neighborhood that they were coming to, was actually not too different from the decks of the ship uh, if you, in terms of density and population. Throughout the, uh, the neighborhood, tenement apartments uh, ruled the streets, uh, on streets like Hester and Eldridge and Allen and Orchard. Uh, these buildings had come about in decades prior, uh, primarily from the German community when the neighborhood was known as Kleine Deutschland. But the tenement apartments, and really the word tenement really comes to, uh, to really be connected with this period of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They were crowded, densely packed with few opportunities for light or air to come into the space. Uh, we can see here in this image made famous uh, by Jacob Reese in his book, How the Other Half Lives, uh, but actually taken by one of his colleagues, Jess uh, Jessica Beals, uh, that the, um, Jesse Beals, that the uh, image, that the apartments here were, were not too big. They were quite crowded uh, and they could have quite a number of um, uh, there are quite a number of um, people inside of them. In this one in particular, we can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people in what is the parlor. The room behind them, just to the left, where you see the window and the doorway is actually the bedroom. And behind the, uh, behind the viewer, or behind the camera in this case, would be the uh, parlor. Uh, this room, in fact, is the kitchen. And you can see on the bottom left-hand side uh, is the stove and the little kettle they're cooking. Uh, you can see also beds inside these apartments. People were sleeping in these uh, apartments anywhere they could, in the living room, in the kitchen, on the floor. Uh, ironically, or perhaps not ironically, the kitchen was the best place uh, in the winter, right near that cast iron coal stove, which was, could be on. It was also the worst place in the summer. Uh, living in these tenements, it's not unsurprising that people would want to get outside, would want to experience the open air and the space. Uh, what they would encounter once they walked out of their tenement apartments, unfortunately, uh, was not much in, uh, for either count. Um, excuse me. Uh, the streets of the neighborhood uh, at that time uh, were packed with countless uh, pushcart peddlers selling their goods and their wares uh, and really whatever they could put on them, uh, they would stick on those carts and take to the streets to sell. Uh, in this image, which dates to about the 1910s, perhaps the 1920s, you're seeing a look uh, around Hester Street, and actually we're coming up on Hester and Orchard Street, and that's uh, PS42 in the background, and people have put on pots and pans, hats, uh, raw food, vegetables, clothing, sewing notions, uh, bread, you know, what, pots and pans, you name it, they would put on these carts and they would be selling them. People from the neighborhood and people from the outside the neighborhood would come to these push carts uh, in order to buy the goods at what was interestingly a discounted price. Uh, you can see here this famous image from 1898 looking uh, south on Orchard Street uh, at the, the crowd of people uh, coming to uh, enjoy the push cart market. Uh, it, to me, it always kind of reminds me a bit like Times Square just without the Elmos. Uh, on the bottom left-hand side, um, you can actually see this woman who's uh, got quite nice clothing on, a, a lovely hat with flowers. Uh, we could safely assume that she is probably visiting from outside of the neighborhood, coming to take advantage of the prices and the push carts. Uh, on the right-hand side, not quite on the right, but close to the center, uh, is this boy who's holding a bunch of cloth that he's taking from one building to the next. He would be called a schlepper carrying goods from one tenement apartment factory, sweatshop really, to the other. 
countless people with countless other stories would be filling these streets constantly. I kind of joke that this is almost a uh, quiet day on the Lower East Side. Uh, looking around, uh, these, this image would be duplicated on every street and every alleyway. Uh, really, in, uh, in, in, well, into the 20, well into the early decades of the 20th century, there really wasn't much in terms of open space. Uh, in some ways, this was actually not what had uh, originally been designed for the neighborhood. Uh, in the colonial period, if we go back to before the revolution, uh, there was a desire to create open space in the Lower East Side. It was masterminded by a family whose name is still attached to the neighborhood, though they've long since left the area. And that, that, that of course, are the Delanceys. Uh, the Delanceys were a great uh, landed family of British New York, colonial New York, uh, and they owned most of the upper section of the Lower East Side. And we can see on this map done in 1867, just before the revolution. Uh, the Delanceys actually owned most of this north area. Uh, we can actually trace some of the boundaries of their estate today, the Southern Street being Division Street, the uh, most Western Avenue being uh, Bowery or Bowery Lane, today, Bowery Street. Uh, and they had this massive uh, house, orchard, and then also uh, the makings of the later grid plan, which would take over most of New York. Right at the center of it was what the Delanceys called the Great Square, and this was to be a park uh, very much akin to what you'd see in London, these square pocket parks that would provide a, a certain, essentially a public backyard for people to escape to, a little, a little corner of a densely packed area that they could get to to enjoy the sun, the trees, the grass, the nature, and, and everything else you might uh, do in a park. You could run around, you could just enjoy your day. Uh, this was one of the first uh, planned open spaces uh, in the city. Uh, there were farms and other open spaces. In fact, the, uh, the estate just to the south of the Delanceys, uh, owned by the Rutgers families, uh, was, had a lot of open space, but those are intended as farms. The Great Square, as it's labeled on this map, was intended to be a kind of a park. Uh, unfortunately for the Lower East Side, uh, the Great Square was undone by the revolution itself. Uh, of the two families I mentioned, the Rutgers and the Delanceys, the Rutgers were noted patriots and have a university named after them across the North River or Hudson River in New Jersey. The Delanceys, on the other hand, were noted Tories who sided with the crown during the conflict. And as a result, their entire estate uh, was seized by the state of New York uh, after the revolution. As to the specific uh, undoing of the Great Square, there is some debate. Uh, some people suggest uh, that the square was torn up by the state as a last act of vengeance towards the Loyalist family. Uh, but there are maps that show British fortifications of New York running straight through the park. So it's possible that the British army attempting to hold uh, the, main, uh, the city of New York, which at the time was just the southern end of Manhattan Island, uh, destroyed uh, their uh, the Loyalist park. By the time we get to the turn of the uh, 20th century, the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, the Great Square and virtually every other open space in the neighborhood had gone. Uh, the tenements ruled the streets, the push carts, excuse, the tenements ruled the blocks, the push cart ruled the streets, and there are very few places, very few open spaces for people to gather. One exception, or at least one kind of public space where people could gather, uh, somewhat ironically enough, is the museum, is the Eldred Seat Synagogue itself. Uh, built over nine months between 1886 and 1887, it was the first grand synagogue built by the Eastern European Jewish community in the United States. Uh, and while it was intended and certainly did serve as a synagogue where the congregation would come together for services at, uh, account, uh, throughout the week, uh, it did also serve as a kind of open space for the community. There are records of people coming here to, uh, to socialize, both during and uh, in, in between services. There are records of town hall meetings here where public issues of the day would be discussed and debated, where speakers could come and address a crowd. Uh, even speakers who would not ordinarily be invited to speak from a synagogue were allowed to. Uh, there's a great example, uh, in, actually in 1900 thereabout, where a town hall meeting was called to discuss the a situation sur uh, surrounding Allen Street, which is which was uh, the major red light district in the neighborhood at the time. One of the speakers then was actually a Roman Catholic priest uh, who came to address the audience that day. 
uh, not something uh, you might expect uh, at a synagogue uh, at that time, and in most synagogues in most contexts today. Uh, thinking about uh, this neighborhood, uh, it's, it's one of densely packed uh, people, it's one of not much open space, and it was an area in, in desperate need of that open space. And as I turn uh, the presentation over to Andrew, we're going to, he's going to begin discussing how this neighborhood, which was the most densely packed in the city and the world, which had turned away, it's the first iteration, the first instance of open space in its history, how that open space would be recreated uh, in this burgeoning metropolis. Uh, thanks a lot, Scott. I appreciate that introduction. Very, very thorough. Uh, um, so I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to start where uh, Scott left off. There, um, we're talking about the 19th century, right? And while playgrounds and public space is, of course, something that we take for granted in New York City today, um, there was a time where, by and large, there wasn't much space, as we've seen from Scott's presentation. Um, a part of this is the grid that began to progress that, that, that Scott had mentioned. Um, the grid was not just something that lacked imagination, right? It lacked an organic feel. It was also reversed from the ideal in terms of solar orientation, um, with south facades receiving all the sunlight and north facades receiving none at all. So it's a bit, you know, a bit haunting, right? That legacy. Um, in addition, there were no real service alleys at this time in New York. And this, so this made the New York gridiron uniquely substandard. Um, that said, it was profitable for landowners. Um, so this is why we have this grid system. It was profitable for landowners. Um, Richard Plunz in his City of the History of Housing in New York City says, quote, even if the city had doubly reimbursed owners, permanent removal of the land from the market would have reduced profits for an infinite future. Right? The original gridiron was designed to maximize profits. Land speculation was big business, still is, I think. The rights of its practitioners were not easily infringed upon. So it's a truism that after the stock market crash of 1929, many policy policymakers sought to take the edge off of some of the unfettered style of capitalism which had thrived in New York uh, so far. Um, and was embodied by the grid layout. But even before that, in what is known as the reform era, many of the socially concerned within New York and other major urban areas began to worry that this system, wherein everything had its price and all that is solid melts into air, as they say, had to be dampened through the setting aside provisions for amenities, not solely geared towards the profit motive. At the forefront, of these concerns was the welfare of children, particularly the children of the urban poor, who at this time were put to work in the dark satanic mills of American prosperity. No longer was the child set to work on the family farm or some more familial undertaking. Rather, these children of the city, the industrial generation, children of the uprooted expendable units of labor, found themselves face to face with the jaws of heavy, dangerous machinery. Surely this was no place for a child to spend their formative years. The question lies at the heart of a deepening sense of what we now call childhood. In an era where even advertisements geared towards adults sort of real like children's programming these days, it may seem strange to us that arguments were once needed uh, to uh, argue for a special time in one's life that would grant a unique attention towards children. But prior to the 19th century, in the era of the family homestead, the prevailing attitude towards children and childhood had for ages been that they were merely approaching adulthood. This is to say children were seen as something like little adults, right? And thus the approach to child rearing 
usually sought to, in an uncharitable interpretation, harangue the child into the expectations of adulthood. However, beginning in large part with the growing effect of Rousseau's book, Emile, on the mid middle classes, whose subject was the education of the child, childhood in the 19th century began to be seen as a special stage in one's life, which required its own unique environment to flourish. Rousseau regarded, um, or argued that rather than forcing reading material on children uh, or schools of thought, uh, that, lessons in uh, that lessons ought to preserve the natural instinct of the child. Thus, the child must remain ignorant of any ideas which are beyond the grasp of its uh, immature intellect. Therefore, far more important than books, which Rousseau sees as corrupting more than anything, his educational program emphasized development of the senses. And it would be through the medium of play that the senses were to be developed, he argued. Now, thus began the playground movement whose momentum started as a concern of middle-class reform women and their organizations. The movement began in roughly the 1880s, some say 1885 as a distinct date. The concern for the child on the part of these women was, as Suzanne Spencer Wood and Renee Blackburn note, an interesting intersection on the feminine horizon of domestic affairs and the masculine horizon of public affairs at this time. After all, these playgrounds were to be public amenities. Right? Indeed, one could say that the hallmark, hallmark of the reform era, both the alleged evils as well as the alleged goods, was the externalization or public publicization of arenas normally associated with interior domestic life, such as education and recreation. The family then was to take a back seat as the primary influence on the lives of children. Where the family could not govern, the state would. And it was the playground which was meant to do just this. And it seemed an antidote to the vices of city life, such as juvenile delinquency, and a special concern in neighborhoods where children had not much else to do but spend their time in the streets, or what's worse, in places uh, uh, in festering immorality, such as pool rooms, bars, theaters, which encouraged coarse and unlawful behavior. The 20th century, after all, would be the beginning of the decade of the motor car. And in this world, which is our current world, the street would be dominated, nay, overwhelmed by the presence of these machines. Carrie Goodman, in his book, Choosing Sides, notes how even before the motor car, there was an increased tension between bicyclist commuters, which was also sort of relatively popularized, and the neighborhoods that they ran through. Neighbors would often deliberately leave glass and refuse on the open streets in order to claim these streets as their own rather than these commuting cyclists. And uh, the cyclists, not wanting to risk another collision between an uncareful child or early family member, began to think that perhaps there's a better place for these children to be. <laughs> um, in any case, there needed to be a provision for alternative spaces for leisure and recreation for children and other older members of the neighborhoods which lacked such space, right? The problem of children playing in the streets was only worsened by what were called draconian street laws, which were passed in 1902, which outright prohibited street play. The playgrounds would lastly be a refuge from the unsanitary conditions of their housing. Playgrounds instead would strengthen the virtues of the community, building a milder, more cooperative character in the, uh, in the children by way of the influence of park attendance. Right? This was the idea initially. This, of course, would result in the children adopting more middle-class values of the reformers. On this aspect of the playground, Timothy Kennard remarks, quote, though the playgrounds provided by city governments did provide relatively safe places to play, they also created spaces which, where the dominant cultures in urban centers work to whittle away at the cultural beliefs, practices, and knowledge held by immigrant families. In New York City, these concerns materialized in what was known as the Outdoor Recreation League. 
an organization formed in 1898 by Charles Stover and Lillian Wald. Both Stover and Wald had been in the social reform game for a while at this point, with Stover founding New York City's very first settlement house, the University Settlement, in 1886, and Wald founding the Henry Street Settlement in 1893. These settlement houses, who get their name from the phenomenon of culturally uh, college-educated elites setting, settling into and working towards the benefits of the poor urban areas through influence of the arts, culture, and acclamation to uh, the finer things, very much had the same aims as the park movement itself. These aims of the Outdoor Recreation League were declared in 1898 to be twofold. One, to obtain recognition of the necessity of recreation and physical exercise as fundamental to the moral and physical welfare of the people, and two, to secure the establishment in the city of New York of proper sufficient recreation spaces, playgrounds, open air gymnasiums for the people. And they would do this purely by way of subscription. We, they weren't getting any money from the city at this point. Um, apparently the idea was so popular that swindlers were known to take advantage of the Outdoor Recreation League's good name and go around asking for donations on their behalf that they would use personally. The problem was so large that Stover actually took out a newspaper ad saying, if anybody asks in person for a donation, do not give it to them. This is not how we solicit donations. Um, the first of these parks was not Seward Park, which we will talk about eventually, but the Hudson Bank Gymnasium. And this was located at 53rd and 11th Avenue. The park was unique for its time. Instead of the pastoral greenery that one finds in Central Park, and, and of course, Prospect Park to this day, Hudson Bank Gymnasium featured equipment specifically geared towards children. According to Stover, Hudson Bank was a great success, attracting an average of 500 visitors each day. Workers from neighboring factories, children, families, and even gang members who enjoyed the open space and recreational opportunities sang its praises. Despite the collection of characters, Jacob Rees of How the Other Half Lives, who Scott mentioned earlier, characterized Hudson Bank as an oasis of civil behavior, claiming, quote, not a single board was stolen from the long fence that encloses it all that time, while the fences all about the park were ripped to pieces. Interesting. So the second park that was run by the Outdoor Recreation League was to be its most historic, for it would be eventually become the first municipally operated park in the United States. This is, of course, the Lower East Side's very own Seward Park. Before the park was built, there was a teeming neighborhood of densely populated tenements, which straddled what was then known as the 10th and 7th wards of the Lower East Side. It was an area famous for its squalor, boasting 522 persons per acre, making it the most crowded slum in the district of, uh, slum district in the Western Hemisphere at this time. The poverty was so vile that this area was known as the pig market. To the health department, it was known as the typhus ward. To the Bureau of Vital Statistics, it was known as the suicide ward. Not great names, right? Clearly the area's reputation for filth preceded it. Exposés of the neighborhood cite horrible smells and disturbing sights, including discarded hogs' heads, feathers, and melon rinds that one could take in if one strolled south of Houston Street towards Hester and Grand. According to an account from The Sun, the slovenly appearance of the barrels and barrels of refuse apparently betrayed the inelegant ways of people living in the 10th Ward. <laughs> in early April of 1896, the land where Seward Park now sits, which is in this picture, was settled as the location for the two new park projects by the Sinking Fund Commission. In 1897, the area south of Hester Street, where Seward Park proper is located, was condemned by the city. And upon condemnation, the buildings were sold at auction at 114 Pitt Street to the highest bidder on August 2nd and 3rd, 1897 at precisely 10 a.m. Residents of the buildings were uh, being sold were not exactly pleased with 
being ousted from their homes, however squalid they were. Swarms of residents mixed with the bidders, eager to discover how much their buildings would sell for. The crowd effectively blocked traffic. Um, upon the sale of the buildings, which was, by the way, were probably just bought for scraps at this point, the new owners had but three weeks to rout out the dwellers to begin tearing down the row. One would like to think that despite the hardship suffered, the residents might have had some money saved for it is believed that not a single family had paid in the condemned blocks had paid their rent since they'd found out they were all about to make way for a park. Though the condemned land belonged to the city, the first operators of Seward Park Playground were the aforementioned Outdoor Recreation League between 1898 and 1902. Over 10,000 people were said to have gathered to witness the outdoor gymnasium's opening, with attendees in the ceremony watching from the rooftops. Facilities on the south side of the grounds included an athletic field, basketball arrangement, and gymnasium hemmed in by a running track. The north side contained swings for babies and children, a croquet ground, sand gardens, seesaws, benches, and a kindergarten tent. And along Essex Street, a hundred yard dash. A small area of closets and storage was allotted. And uh, the amenities even stripped the, uh, that of the aforementioned Hudson Bank Gymnasium. And we can tell from its features, uh, organized play was what was uh, encouraged at this. It's interesting to note at this point, play was so much the focus that there weren't even any benches located in this park. So right from the beginning, the Seward Park site of the ORL cited problems with transients catching a snooze on, uh, you know, in and around the park. Uh, regular runs were made through the park by police to rouse them from their slumber. And though the park was meant to encourage more organized play for the children, regret was expressed at the lack of any. But for the people, the playground was clearly a hit. In 1900, plans were already being made to transfer the operation of Seward Park from the ORL to the city. To this end, the ORL confidently submitted a, um, a plan for the permanent creation of a playground right? Gymnasium grounds and amphitheater, all sorts of, uh, you know, playground type stuff. The league's plan was rejected by the city initially. Instead, the Department of Parks proposed a lawn, trees, right? Walking paths, the sort of things you would expect to find in Central Park or Prospect Park. But this was precisely what the ORL and other sympathetic reformers sought to resist. It is said that Jacob Rees had been walking on the main lawn of Mulberry Bend Park, which was a nearby park, marveling at the presence of grass in one of the most densely populated areas of Manhattan. And a policeman told him to keep off the grass. Reese declared that the future of the urban park ought to be one where a keep off the grass sign was nowhere in sight. A compromise needed to be made between the parks department and the ORL. The final plan for Seward Park offered such a one, placing playgrounds in a park-like setting, establishing a precedent for future park development. The design was a hybrid space for playgrounds and active recreation, um, and in the anticipation for the opening was tremendous. Right? People could hardly hold themselves back. Uh, they were clamoring across the fences to get in, but finally the park was open in October 17, 1903. And the crowds from the city takeover were even greater than that of the initial opening ceremony, with 20,000 people being in attendance. Parks Commissioner Wilcox took the stand and said, I did not come to make a speech. And he was greeted by hurrahs and roars from the children for two whole minutes that completely drowned out the speech that Wilcox no doubt intended to make. Seth Lowe, who was now mayor of New York, attended the ceremony despite being bombed by political radicals, making a speech at the ORL's opening ceremony years prior, and rows of police were needed to keep the children in order. A basketball game was played between the Hamilton Fish and Seward Park Boys, where players tripped each other up, purposely hit each other in the eye, and with the ball, amongst other injuries. Perhaps the spirited play of Seward Park basketball team was summed up 
in their official slogan, a chant which ran, sweet potato, sweet potato, 30 cents a peck. Whoever plays Seward Park gets it in the neck. The park was an immediate success and some four to 7,000 children uh, with some four to 7,000 children per day. Um, the attendants, however, had a very, very hard time taking care of the children. Often children were left there for the day by their parents who were off to work. Both parents worked, right? And so the park was, in, in a manner of speaking, treated like a bit of a daycare center, right? Um, but it was a fine place to spend uh, your, your time in your childhood. It was certainly better than the streets, I would, I would say. And as mentioned earlier, uh, uh, we won't spend too much time on this, but I just wanted to mention that one of the first features of this park was a bathhouse, right? And uh, it was a very popular place. It could accommodate uh, 200 persons within it. Plenty of political rallies were held around this, this bathhouse. Um, and uh, it was a perfect place to watch uh, park activities, right? Children playing, people, you know, having conversations, and even the Monk Eastman gang who would pretend to start a fight and then while the onlookers were looking at the fight, they would pick each other's uh, people's pockets. <laughs> Plenty of things to see in the old park. Um, it even had, uh, so we mentioned it was a bathhouse and it had hot water and cold water that flowed from the taps. The cold water was so unpopular that uh, the, the uh, residents of the area ripped out the cold water faucets so that only hot would run. And they ended up replacing it with a single faucet that only ran warm water. I think that's a little interesting fact. <laughs> um, just a little note in passing, this big pavilion was moved to the other side of the park um, around about the 1940s um, to when the F train was built to connect Delancey Street and East Broadway, which was becoming a new stop at that, at that point. And it was demolished altogether uh, with the renovation of the park under Robert Moses. But back to our, uh, what we're here for. So not only was play suggested as an educative aspect of childhood, but so was uh, farming at this time. Um, you may know that the Educational Alliance in the early days of Seward Park ran a farm on the grounds of Seward Park. The idea of having farms and parks could be traced to a woman named Fanny Griscom Parsons who's pictured here. She was a reformer, educator, and philanthropist um, who did much to introduce the idea of the practice of farming to children. She would declare the 20th century to be the, the century of the child and that uh, it was a fervent uh, believer in the beneficence of farming as a sort of as pastoral elements as good for childhood development. Parsons was reported to have said, quote, the Bible shows how the world progressed. It begins in the garden and ends in the holy city. I simply went back to the beginning, <laughs> end quote. Um, the first farming program uh, was not in Seward Park, however. It was in the DeWitt Clinton farm, which was across the street from a school. Um, fairing programs in uh, parks was, was became an outdoor recreation league uh, affair by association. Um, the idea of parks, as Commissioner Wilcox argued, was not to be for beauty alone, but for the acquiry, uh, inquiry, uh, acquiring of knowledge uh, as well. So this was a place where people could uh, experience wholesome sort of recreation, right? Now, as for the park in Seward Park, there was a variety of bumper crops and vegetables. Crops were reaped during harvest day. Um, they were said to feed about 90 families during harvest, which is quite remarkable, I think. And uh, they, would uh, they would enter, in, uh, the children enter into competitions and win rewards for the, for the, for the best harvest. It was really, a, really a cool thing. Um, um, there's one article that I love that was written that talked about the strange combination of the Lower East Side mannerisms with farming. Uh, it said they quoted children's, uh, children saying, don't destroy the soil, uh, was said to be the watchword of these East Side children. Look out or you'll spoil the earth. Anyway, that was their uh, sort of uh, phonetic way of 
uh, recording what the children were saying. There was another article written that observes how an instructor, Dr. Henry Fleischman, joked that, with the boys that uh, he pointed to an ear of corn and said, when I was a boy, I used to dry this corn silk and smoke it. What do you boys smoke? And they replied, we smoke camels. <laughs> um, uh, another boy who had won many prizes for his skills in growing crops was asked what he intended to do after school. And he replied, oh, probably a botanist. You know, not an ordinary farmer, but a botanist. Um, but as the neighborhood depopulated and city services in general and educational services more specifically became more centralized, amenities such as parks and organized play started to see a bit of a downturn. And I don't really think we see any evidence of sewer park having farming beyond I don't know, I would say the 40s or 50s. I'm not really sure when they closed the farm down. DeWitt Clinton Farm, the, park, the farm that started it all, closed in 1932. Um, and uh, the urgency of parks and the urgency of organized play began to see be seen as more of an antiquated notion as public schools began to be equipped with playgrounds, for instance, or that public school attendance became more compulsory. Right, so there was less of a, children were at school all day. They didn't have to be in the park all day, right? But I think the thing that really put the kibosh on parks altogether was probably the changing face of the city, right? Into what many urbanists call the city efficient. Um, we have the old neighborhood, cramped tenements, uncomfortable conditions. People were outside as a matter of course, but with these new buildings, right, public housing cooperatives, they were large enough, got plenty of sunlight, they had kitchens, hot water, windows, bathrooms, what need was there to go outside? So it seemed less urgent to get behind uh, programs such as the ORL, right? And in fact, this intersection of parks and housing is uh, where I'd like to uh, pass it on to Scott because he's going to finish us off here today. So uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, go ahead and take it from here. Um, let me just stop sharing my screen. Here. Uh, Scott, we don't have audio for you. I'm sorry. Thank you. There you are. Perfect. So when we're, I was just saying that that's a great place uh, to stop because when we're talking about parks and really housing, uh, those two things have such great uh, connection in the Lower East Side because of some of the other parks that follow uh, Seward Park, which you were discussing. Um, uh, one of them actually uh, still exists and is, is one of the focus, main focuses of debate uh, over parks uh, in the Lower East Side today. And that of course is uh, Sarah D. Roosevelt Park. Uh, that one was built before the rise of co-ops as you mentioned of this perfect city that, that Robert Moses would uh, champion in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Uh, the irony of course is that Sarah D. Roosevelt Park was one of Robert Moses's, at least in, in part creation. Uh, the entire block right, and really the whole strip of blocks that make up the park stretching uh, roughly from uh, 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 Delancey Street all the way south uh, and uh, to uh, Canal Street uh, and, made, and a little bit higher as well. Uh, we're actually demolished in the 1930s uh, and a little uh, late early 1930s as part of a housing experiment. They were supposed to build an entire uh, new block of, of experimental style housing uh, on this uh, site. Uh, but as uh, weeks uh, and year, months and years went by and, and the project never developed, uh, it was decided to convert uh, the now vacant land into a park for uh, folks to use. Uh, you can see this image of the park opening. Uh, there were thousands of people out that day. And, and though I'm still trying to find it in this image, there was supposedly a cannon uh, that was fired off to mark the opening uh, of this park. Uh, what you can see uh, in the image, very much akin to what Andrew was discussing in connection with Seward Park, are some of those uh, 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 pieces of equipment and, and activities that were the hallmark of the child-oriented park as opposed to the uh, akin to Seward Park as instead of the more uh, manicured uh, gardening uh, garden style uh, that we see in Central Park. I'm referring, of course, to the 
basketball hoops, the swing sets, uh, the slides on the left and the right. Um, this park had vast open spaces where folks could play uh, handball and tennis. And uh, what I quite like about this park in particular is the fact that it's set down uh, in the ground. So folks observing from the side get a really nice uh, eye, uh, birds, uh, almost not quite bird's eye view, but uh, elevated view of the goings on. Uh, the games were uh, both individual, but also organized. And you can see here this uh, game of uh, perhaps baseball or stickball uh, being played. Uh, the park uh, is still a feature uh, of uh, Lower East Side today, although some of the equipment has been changed out. You don't have nearly as many slides or swings, uh, but you do have a lovely uh, manicured uh, soccer field for people to play. Uh, you also have a fantastic playground where kids can still run around. And in this one, uh, it's a little off center just to the left of the image, but they do have a swing set, uh, very important. Uh, as well as basketball uh, courts for uh, kids to enjoy. Um, in some ways, though, this park is sort of a tale of two halves because those images taken uh, really towards the southern end of the park near uh, Canal Street and Grand Street and Hester Street uh, and Broom uh, is, is very different from the park when you go uh, more to the north, going all the way up to um, uh, Houston Street. I think I said it ended at uh, Delancey, but it ends up at Houston Street. Uh, at the northern end of the park, you can see this is a kind of uh, a public garden akin to what uh, the gardening, uh, what the uh, organizations were doing in the 1910s and 20s and 30s uh, is one of the nice uh, gems of that northern end of the park. Uh, sections of it are not as well kept. And there's actually a ongoing debate right now uh, because the city is using two of the three structures uh, in the park as storage areas for the parks department uh, writ large uh, and not opening them up to the community. Um, the other uh, really interesting uh, open uh, space in the park that uh, may have borrowed a bit from Seward Park, but I think perhaps borrowed a bit more from Central Park in its way, not quite following the lead of the reformers that Andrew was mentioning, uh, is Allen Street. And I mentioned Allen Street earlier uh, in connection with that meeting held at the Eldridge Street Synagogue. It was uh, until uh, the 1930s and 40s, the red light district of the neighborhood. And that was centered under this elevated uh, train line, the L as it was called, which conveyed people from Chatham Square in modern day Chinatown all the way north to uh, 96th Street in what is Harlem. Uh, it was a great utility for uh, the folks of the area being erected in the, 19 in the 1870s. Uh, but by the 1930s and 40s, the tracks had become antiquated, the equipment, the trains and the cars were no longer uh, viable, uh, and a lot of uh, problems had been occurring on the street beneath the elevated train lines. The city wanted to both move the trains underground, they had opened up the modern subway system in 1904, uh, but also create something of an, a promenade for people to walk in. Uh, some people, uh, the city leaders at the time proclaimed that Allen Street would be the Park Avenue of the Lower East Side. And to, facil to facilitate that, they actually, uh, as they did with almost all the elevated trains in Manhattan, removed the train tracks in the 1930s and, excuse me, 40s. Uh, but they did also take it a step further. They actually demolished uh, an entire side of a city block, an entire half of a block. Uh, and it, that is the section on the right hand side you can see here. And that was running. Uh, for all, all the way from the East River on when Allen Street is Pike Street, all the way north to, uh, to uh, Delancey Street, and how, uh, in fact, uh, up to Houston Street as the uh, built, uh, Allen Street, as it becomes Allen Street after a certain curve. Uh, the promenade was created, uh, and certain sections of it are quite beautiful. This is an image taken uh, looking south of on Allen Street from uh, Delancey Street. And you can see that sections of it are manicured. They have benches uh, as uh, open green spaces uh, tend to do, as, as uh, Andrew mentioned. And there's even, it's, it's a little faint here, but there's even a bit of, of sculpture uh, here uh, in, in amongst the greenery. Uh, when you walk south, however, when you get towards Canal Street and you make the left-hand turn going towards uh, at Pike Street, uh, there are certain sections of it that have not been uh, as very well maintained. This is a more modern section. And then this is the section uh, I'm referencing. This is looking north, uh, just south of Canal Street. Uh, the 
there's not as much greenery. Uh, there are older trees and much of the <coughs> Much of the concrete has been uh, uplifted uh, by the trees and the city has not unfortunately done as much uh, in this section uh, to uh, make it as beautiful as they have sections in the northern end. Uh, in some ways, this is almost the inverse of what I had mentioned about Sarah D. Roosevelt Park, uh, whereas the northern end was not quite as well kept as the southern in this area, the southern end is not as well kept as the northern end. Uh, these parks that Andrew and I have been talking about, I'm going to just stop my share so we can uh, join the rest of the conversation. Uh, these open spaces that in some ways began in uh, the Lower East Side, taken, taken uh, in inspiration from the reform movement uh, and the other smaller parks that had been created uh, throughout the area, uh, would lead to uh, a really a revolution in open spaces throughout the city. Uh, Andrew mentioned that Seward Park was a, sort of a, a very different uh, way of laying out a park with uh, places for adults to sit on benches, but also kids to play. And that would be a model that we see uh, throughout the uh, Lower East Side and, and throughout the city uh, even today. Thank you so much. This was really great. Um, I, if we're ready to open it up, um, I wanted to start off actually, um, Andrew, um, I feel like your institution is so unique because you have this symbiotic relationship the park and the library um, have with each other. Um, I was wondering if you can elaborate on that before we turn it over to our guests. Yeah, sure. Um, well, the park was built before the library and the library was, it was a location of um, a version of the library as it exists today in the Educational Alliance at that time. Uh, so it was directly across the street. It was part of another library system called the Aguilar Free Circulating Library. And when the Aguilar Free Circulating Library merged with the uh, NYPL, the NYPL picked that, that plot of land across the street from the park where the library is today to um, build a bigger facility because it was a very, very popular location. Um, Back in the day, if you know where Jefferson Street is, that used to cut the library from the park. And you had Division Street cutting the other side. It wasn't until the construction of the cooperative houses, the Seward Park cooperative houses, that they paved over the street and connected the park to the library, right? Um, and, uh, you know, things are getting better and better, I suppose, in some cases. Now we have this lovely uh, brick courtyard outside the library that was constructed in order to um, uh, integrate the library into the park even further aesthetically. And I think it's a really, really nice thing. And today they all look like this one single institution, right? <laughs> yeah, so the, the park and the library have always had this very, very close relationship. It's so interesting how things evolve. Um, I have some saved questions in the chat before we get to folks who um, would like to ask their questions out loud. Um, Miriam Fisher asks if there are any similar stories in other parts of the city with farms for children or or these kinds of parks cropping up at, at a similar time. I think there were many. There were more. There was certainly more than one example. Um, this was furthermore a nationwide phenomenon. Um, this idea that children could benefit from, that urban children uh, could benefit from, uh, you know, being in more in touch with the seasons, the pastoral life, these sorts of things. Um, in Rousseau's book, Emil, through this whole sort of, this whole school of thought is based, uh, Rousseau recommends, deliberately recommends avoiding the city. So the question was, how would you introduce these bucolic ideals into a city child? And I think, I think reformers across the United States saw the park as a way of doing this. Um, it was a nationwide phenomenon. And it was even a phenomenon actually stretching back in some ways to the founding, the idea of urban versus rural, the uh, Jeffersonian ideal of the yeoman farmer trying to push people out of cities into the rural environment. That's uh, sort of one of the main tensions uh, that's been characterizing this country and, and others uh, for, for many, many years. Absolutely. I, you see it all over the place to build up what Andrew was saying. 
It's always, how can you be in the city without being in the city, and how can you be in a rural area without being in a rural area? <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> we have a question from, well, Richard, not not quite a question, but Richard um, thanks us for hinting that Sarah, um, Sarah D. Roosevelt Park has fallen on hard times in the north section, and he says it is a real shame. Is there any, um, which I think we all agree, are there any, are there any updates with um, that over the years? What's been the evolution like there, or is it kind of stagnant? So really it's uh, a creature of, of, the, of the Lower East Side itself and of the evolution there. When, when the park first opens, it's almost entirely designed for uh, people to use and, and maintain. Uh, one uh, sort of uh, issue with the park, if you could call it that, was actually the name. Uh, the park was called Sarah D. Roosevelt in, in honor of FDR's mother, and it was uh, sort of a Machiavellian ploy by Robert Moses attempting to curry favor with uh, President Roosevelt, who was his own old adversary. Uh, but the park really, uh, as Andrew was saying, with other parks sort of begins to see its hard times with the uh, 1930s and 40s as people are leaving uh, later, a little bit early in its life. But it's really in the 1970s and 80s when uh, much of the city is having issues with budgetary uh, the holes that the park really uh, falls into some disrepair and those sections of it have been repaired in the past couple of decades there are sections that just still haven't really been brought completely out of that era yet andrew i don't know if you wanted to add anything um i mean i'll i'll, I'll just add something real quick it's a little fact about sarah roosevelt park that i love is the tenements which were raised to construct it uh, were originally raised not for the purpose of a park, but for the purpose of building model housing. Um, for years, uh, all these articles were written gushing about the possibility of like model homes being in this area. And that's why the park is so strangely shaped, right? Like it's not just this square, this plot that most parks are. It's this block length long thing. It's because that was supposed to be a string of housing developments. It didn't come to pass and it became a park we all love and know today. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm just going to add to that and, and sort of mirror that on Allen Street because the, the whole purpose of, in part, of knocking down Allen Street, at least what the promises there was that they were going to build an underground version of the uh, train line. And, and they promised, they, they pinky swore that they would build an underground version. And, and, and in fairness, they did indeed complete three stations uh, of that underground uh, train line there at uh, 80, uh, 96th, 86th, and 72nd Streets. And they opened in December of 2017. Uh, that was the Second Avenue L, Second Avenue Subway, and they're still saying they're going to come down to the Lower East Side, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure uh, the timeline on that. Well, it happened eventually, <laughs> and I think, I think strange shapes on the Lower East Side is something that we're used to <laughs> when you get below 14th Street or even, I guess, Fourth Street. Um, Bert brings up um, what the um, racial discrimination issues were during the development of this entire movement, which I think is very relatable to this conversation. You know, it's interesting. There, there have been there, there has been discrimination in the area, and as it pertains to housing, uh, Seward Park houses, for instance. I think there was a lawsuit sometime. Well, I forget the decade. I think maybe the 70s or 80s, please correct me if any of you know more about this, but there was a lawsuit that um, uh, Puerto Rican tenants were being kept out of those developments. And of course, in the immediate Spur area, there have been, uh, there have been empty lots where a, neighbor, a thriving multicultural neighborhood used to stand uh, that we really had, that we hadn't seen developed until the you know, past five years. And a lot of the people who used to live in those tenements are long gone by now. Um, with parks, we can only speculate. I will say there's this charming 60 millimeter film uh, that I watch, uh, that I screen from time to time at um, Stewart Park Branch. It's called Phyllis and Terry. And it's by uh, Eugene Marner. And oh, he made it with his wife. I forget her first name, but the Marners, they were sort of notable for doing these uh, fun little films. And they followed these two African-American girls in the neighborhood in about 1963 or 64. And they visit Sarah D. Roosevelt Park and it's really remarkable to see all different kinds of children playing together in that park in the 1960s. Um, again, you know, there's I think they, I think there are often multiple realities at play, but you know, uh, 
those are my little anecdotes on your question uh, that I, uh, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I, I would add to that. Um, I, I, don't, I can't speak to any specific, I don't know of any specific uh, racial limitations, at least official ones put in place at Seward Park or any of the Lower East Side parks. Uh, that's not to say that there weren't informal uh, uh, restrictions or, or rules imposed, uh, but there is a great, uh, I hate to, has, actually, actually, I don't want to, want to take that word back. There is a, a fascinating uh, story about uh, discrimination in parks writ large in the 20th century. If anyone's ever read uh, Robert Caro's The Power Broker, a great book if anyone needs uh, several months of page turner. Uh, it's a great, great book on the history of Robert Moses. But there's, uh, as parks commissioner, he uh, is said to have actually altered and, or spe specified the temperature at different New York City pools within the park system so that uh, parks in, quote, wider areas were colder and parks in minority areas were warmer, thinking that that would keep people separate. Um, there's also uh, a suggestion that the motifs, uh, the animal motifs in the uh, parks uh, in Harlem uh, were slightly different from the motifs in other uh, parks in New York City. Uh, but aside from those two anecdotes, I really I, I really can't speak to any specific limitations. I don't want to say they, they weren't present, but I, I just don't know of them. Yes, Robert Moses definitely wasn't known for being the best personality in that category. Um, I know, I know. In, in in my studies, we always spoke about how he he built those little overpass bridges to be just short enough so that a bus couldn't safely pass underneath of it, which limited a great deal of the of the population from being able to access public beaches at that time. So definitely, all these things we're still undoing today. Um, we also have a question from Zoe. She asks, "Was the fresh water in the Delancey photo the collect pond?" Absolutely, it was. Uh, that was one of the few freshwater sources in Lower Manhattan. Um, the uh, Collect Pond, of course, no longer exists. It uh, now, what now sits upon it, is fully square, and the state and federal courthouses uh, just to its east. Uh, but that freshwater was Collect Pond, uh, as it would later be known. Um, I don't know how fresh it was, though, as you get to the 19th century. Um, the, it wasn't so fresh at that point, but earlier in its life, it was. I have one more from Toby, who is very curious about what the model housing at Sarah D. Park would have been like. The drawings, we only have drawings, obviously, because they're never realized, but the drawings remind me of um, the public housing in Williamsburg, um, the sort of more cutting edge, older public housing that was designed by, I can never really, I don't know how to pronounce his name. William Lascais. Let me type in the um, the last name here in the chat. William Lascais. He was he was a quite a cutting. His office uh, was in Manhattan. Uh, it looked very different from the rest of the buildings at that time. It was very modernist, very cutting edge building. And the Williamsburg houses, uh, or the houses in Williamsburg, they're called Ten Eyck or Ten Eyck Walk. That's what the uh, project is called, Ten Eyck Walk. Um, looks very different from most uh, public housing you see. And for that reason, um, uh, the a lot of the Cherry Street drawings look a lot like Ten Eyck Walk. Uh, the buildings were raised around the same time. I think the designer might have even been the same. I think Lascaze was going to design the Cherry Street houses. The drawings certainly look like a, like a Lascaze work. Um, one of the notable features is when we think of public housing, we usually think of the Cabousier Tower in the park where they're a million miles high. Uh, not so for Ten Eyck Walk and not so for the Cherry Street, uh, the, sorry, not Cherry Street, Cherry Model Housing. They were about six floors in height, round about, more or less, right? Um, very, very modernist pictures. Um, very interesting building envelope uh, imagination. You know, uh, it was it was a time where there was more imagination around public housing and what public housing was meant to be. Um, the mid century was a completely different attitude. If I can uh, jump in and sort of ask a follow up question to that, Andrew, uh, I, I know this is sort of a, a little a passion of yours, and I've enjoyed listening to it both tonight and uh, in our earlier planning meetings. But I'm just uh, curious uh, if uh, there's, a, there's a reason for the shift between this one form of housing to the later Le Corbusier and Spy Tower uh, developments. Well, it goes back to the grid, right? Um, I mean, that's 
more of a manner of speaking, but the grid was proof of how important land speculation was. And so I think that at a certain point, it became more important to warehouse people than it came to provide quality of life to poor people. The second and I think major component with public housing that I don't think is appreciated a lot is um, the income cap on public housing used to be much higher. Um, in Vienna, for instance, where a lot of the early projects in New York were inspired by, like those in Harlem, uh, Ten Eyck Walk, um, which are much smaller in human scale, uh, Vienna was the model. Uh, they called it Red Vienna. And the public housing in Vienna still exists to this day in excellent condition. Um, and I think the one of one of the attitudes towards public housing in Vienna, though, that distinguishes it from the United States was public housing was seen to be something of middle income to low income. And so you had this mixed residence sort of attitude. Whereas in the United States, public housing has always, the attitude has always been it's for the most desperate or it's for, you know, and I think that that creates a certain attitude towards public housing, right? By, by the general public, people don't see it as something for them. People, and, and the reason for that is the influence of the real estate, uh, of the real estate board. Uh, of, of, well, I don't know if they were called the real estate board in New York back then, but basically real estate put a stopper on public, they threatened to put a stopper on public housing if it ate into uh, a potential customer base who could buy their own property. They said, if someone can buy their own property, they should not be in public housing. And so they had to keep lowering and lowering and lowering the income threshold in order to receive um, uh, the votes in Congress for approving uh, a lot of the major uh, uh, title approvals in public housing in 1949, uh, which is really when you start to see those giant towers. So there's a there's a there's a huge number of factors as to why it looks different now than it did then. I think Catherine in the chat while we have you on, Andrew, wants um, an elaboration on the importance of the bathhouses at that time. And when did they stop? When when did, were they taken away? Well, the importance of the bathhouses links into everything we've been talking about today. Um, you know, links into the idea that you didn't have okay. access to uh, clean water uh, sometimes in your own home. You certainly didn't have access to like an open air sort of setting, right? And so the bathhouse was a place where people gathered to cool off or people gathered, you know, whether it was in the air or with cold water or something like that. Um, the bathhouse in Seward Park is inoperable after 1941 where they demolished them. Um, as for other bathhouses throughout the city, I often wonder when the last bathhouse was closed. I'm not sure. But there, it used to be a fairly common way, it used to be a fairly common amenity in public parks, bathhouses. And I, again, it has everything to do with the changing landscape of what housing is, what a city is, what neighborhoods are. As soon as you get um, buildings where people can more comfortably stay at home, it becomes less urgent to offer these extravagant public amenities. Maybe we still should, but it, it's not an urgency. It's now seen as a luxury, right? <laughs> so I think that's the difference in attitude there. And just to sort of build on that, I think one of the great ironies, of course, is, is that you don't, this, the city does require indoor plumbing to be put into buildings in 1901, the Tenement House Act. That doesn't come into force until 1905, and and yes, it is challenged by landlords. But the the irony is is actually also challenged by tenants who didn't want to pay the higher rates for these additional amenities. So sort of this tension within the the tenant population, the population in tenements as well, where many of them wanted uh, to have amenities like a bathhouse, but others didn't. Uh, so there, there's a lot of uh, financial forces, just as there were with. Uh, of public housing in the 40s and 50s, there was uh, pressure uh, for these amenities in the early 20th century too. And Scott, I was hoping you could elaborate more on um, the role of the Eldridge Street Synagogue in all of this. So, you know, it's it's fascinating because the Eldridge Street Synagogue really served as the the place to sort of get away from the day-to-day -day realities of the of the neighborhood where you could step out 
uh, from off a crowded street out of its crowded tenement and walk into a space with 50 foot high ceilings, six over 60 stained glass windows, which uh, worth saying are on all four walls and on the ceilings. You don't see too many stained glass windows on ceilings. And so it was a, it was a way to get a, get a space to get away from that. And it was a space to come into a building very much inspired by some of those old world structures, ones that you would see in Vienna or Budapest or, or Berlin or Frankfurt or Munich. Um, and, and it was just this place to, to get away. And at the same time, uh, it was a place to discuss these issues. Uh, one of the, the non-religious purposes I didn't mention earlier was actually a, uh, uh, organization, a relief society was distributed relief aid uh, at the Eldridge Street Synagogue, uh, in there was a, a house fire in the a tenement fire in the 1890s, and the whole house, building was burned down. Uh, and they invited the residents to come and collect uh, charitable aid. Um, there's also a fantastic article. I, I, I talk about this all the time, but I just love this article so much uh, from 1887 from the first Passover services date. New York Sun sent uh, a reporter and an illustrator down to uh, get a sense of the scene. Uh, and, and what they it report back, uh, and it, it's really taken from this perspective of a of a of two non-Jewish uh, New Yorkers seeing a Jewish uh, congregation assembled for the first time. And what, what they're seeing is something very different from what they're used to, a space where people are talking and, and, and communicating and, and having conversations uh, where people are, are uh, really coming together in some ways as a community. And so while, uh, of course, synagogues serve a fundamental role for religious observances, for worship, for traditions, there was also some element of the social happening uh, in here in, in a way that you really uh, didn't have seen in New York City since, uh, and I'm gonna throw a, a term that we haven't discussed yet tonight, but really since the, the saloons of Kleine Deutschland, and these were sort of ground floor uh, bars where people would come together, kind of a shared living room. Uh, in some ways, uh, the synagogue also served as that kind of shared living room, no alcohol to be sure, except for some wine, uh, but it was a place where people could come together and, and uh, as a community uh, in more ways than one. And it is worth mentioning, we were talking about the bathhouses that Eldridge Street had indoor plumbing and all those kinds of things before it was considered, you know, commonplace to, to do so. Indoor, indoor lighting was installed in 1907, which is about 15 years beforehand, and they did have sinks where you could wash your hands. Uh, and uh, just behind the building, not directly connected to it, but just behind it was a Turkish bathhouse run by Gittel Nadelson. Uh, who was a female entrepreneur, not something one tends to hear about from this period of history, but she ran a, a, Russian, me, a Russian bathhouse. Uh, and one of the baths in this house was a mikvah uh, that was actually the first dis, uh, contemporary mikvah discovered in the Lower East Side from this period. They found it around 2001, 2002. Uh, and so th there was a lot happening around the Eldridge Street Synagogue uh, in, in ways that, in some ways that mirrored the, the, the need for open space and served that need and in other ways, uh, you know, didn't, but it was just, it's a fascinating space. That and now. Uh, Andrew, do you want to um, tell the community anything about the, um, some of the, the fixer uppers that they're doing at the museum right now? Right now I'm in the West Village at Jefferson Market Branch. That's where I'm coming to you from right now. And that is because, the, yes, as you mentioned, the branch is closed. Um, we're getting wooden floors put in to the uh, public floors, first, second, and third. Um, the floors are meant to be similar to those that were in the original branch. Um, FYI, Tompkins Square is also closed for the same reason. Why they wanted to close this at the same time, I don't know. But Tompkins Square is closed for the same reason. They're getting an even fuller top to bottom renovation, walls, everything. Um, it'd be nice if we got all that too, but then again, we'd be closed for longer. So hopefully we'll be back at you in uh, July or August. <laughs> Thank you again. Uh, Absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in for a moment. Andrew, if they're trying to, Andrew, if they're trying to make the library like it was, tell them to bring the roof deck back. <laughs> I know, right? Wouldn't that be something? We can bring back the rooftop reading room. Yeah, we used to have a rooftop reading room, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, the, the reason we don't have one anymore sort of speaks to this difference in, you know, city planning these days that I talked about with parks versus housing. Like when you have an air conditioning system, yeah. it seems to take away, you know, these grand amenities such as a rooftop reading room. 
uh, because everything now is indoors. It's, 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 it's on the one hand, it's very convenient to have air conditioning and it's very convenient to have a place where you can relax at home and feel comfortable, but the public life also suffers a bit, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no more questions, I want to thank um, Andrew and Scott so much for being here with us today. Um, this was really a fantastic program, and I thank everybody for joining us. Um, we love partnering with Seward Park Library, and we hope to do so again in the future. Sure, we will. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank, thank Thanks you so much. Terrific so thanks program. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.